Hello, I'm Vince Farrell, lead pastor here at Journey Church, and with me is Brent Williams, who's bringing the message this morning. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be talking about going from spectator mode into participation mode, because oh, yeah. sometimes we get trapped in that spectator mode, and right. God is really wanting to bring us deeper. So my hope is this morning that you'll hear the Holy Spirit encourage you to be more this morning. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we want you to be included in what God designed meeting together in person is meant to accomplish. So gather with us at 10 a.m. at 425 Millbrook Drive. Absolutely, that's right. It's why we truly believe being at Journey could change your life forever. That's right. Absolutely. God bless. God bless. Welcome to Journey Church. Our church exists to help people find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at OurJourney.tv. Welcome home. Welcome to Journey Church. I want to talk to you today about a subject called Spectators and Players. And I want to talk to you today, and hopefully at the end of this, uh, I'm going to teach you how or, 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 or encourage you how to become a champion. All right, do I got any sports fans in here? Sports fans, I got some sports fans, but I love baseball. That was my sport. I remember when I was 13 years old, I remember sitting in my living room, and for the first time, a team that I followed in sports was about to win the World Series. It was 1982. I'm kind of dating myself a little bit here. <clears throat> it was 1982, and I sat in the living room, and I watched the St. Louis Cardinals beat the Milwaukee Brewers. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved the atmosphere. I loved the, being a part of the team. I loved the uniform. I loved the smell of the ballpark, the hot dogs. There ain't no, there's nothing like a ballpark hot dog. I loved the camaraderie. I loved the high fives. I loved the grass and the dirt. I loved everything about baseball. Loved it all, all of it. My passion was unmatched. Absolutely. There was only one issue, Alan, one issue I had. I wasn't good at baseball. <laughs> I wasn't good. I was terrible. I was terrible at baseball. I loved it, but I, I was terrible at it. I was scared of the ball. If someone threw me the ball, it was like, maybe it hit the glove. I don't know. I was, had my eyes closed. I, was, I, I, I just wasn't good at it. See, I was just happy with being part of the environment. I love to be a part of the environment. I was thrilled to be part of the team. I was content with just sitting in the dugout on the bench. I could cheer my team better than anybody. My, I, was, I was vocal. However, when it came to participating... And being productive on the field, I had very little value. That's just a fact. That was the truth. Sometimes as Christian churchgoers, we're just happy with being in the environment. I know that hurt a little bit. We're just happy to be part of a church. We enjoy the atmosphere. We enjoy the worship music. Who, do, who doesn't love the worship music? I mean, it's awesome. We enjoy the preaching and the teaching. We love to be with our friends. Nothing wrong with any of that. It's really good. But the truth is, we just love to be a spectator. And we're not very good at participating. We limit ourselves to fandom when we have the ability to be a player. We love to be in the midst of it, but we don't allow ourselves to be enveloped by it. Now, I said something there. I said something. I said we love to be in the midst of it, but we don't allow ourselves to be enveloped by it when we're talking about being in the midst of something what we're talking about is a location we're talking about a the middle of something or a part of something a geographical location we love to be in the midst of it 
However, being enveloped by something is a totally different thing. Being enveloped by something is being wrapped up in it, being covered by it, being surrounded completely by it. When God envelops you, two things happen. One, he becomes your shield. I mean, he's thankful for that. But the second thing he does is he begins to nurture us into something bigger than we ever thought we could be. He begins to nurture us. And when I say this word nurturing, what I mean is that that means he takes care of us. He cares for us. He encourages our growth. He encourages our development. He brings us into a position of growth. So about the third year into my baseball career, career, he came to me and he said, hey, you going to play baseball this next year? Of course I'm going to play baseball. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. He just looked at me and go, okay. He left the room. About a couple of days later, there was a knock on our front door. And uh, I opened the door, and there stands Trevor Green. None of y'all know who Trevor Green is. <laughs> You're like, is he a famous, what is it? what's he done? For? He's, you don't know him. But I knew him, and our community knew him because he was the best baseball player in the league. My dad and his dad were best friends growing up. So apparently my dad made a phone call to his dad and said, Hey, I hope he didn't say my son stinks at baseball. (laughs) But all of a sudden Trevor Green is at the door. And this was a big deal because it was... It was Trevor Green, right? So Trevor took me out, and he started to show me some things. He started to who show me what the best batting stance, and he showed me the proper way to look at the ball and the rotation of the ball. And he was getting into some really deep things, and he showed me how to properly choke the bat. And he, he showed me how, when I was in the field, how to watch where the, you know, anticipate where the ball's going when the ball leaves the bat. He started showing me all these different things. He started taking me under his wing, and he started to teach me and to invest in me. And the more and more that I became accustomed to that, something started changing inside of me. I went from having a zero batting average, because you can't really hit the ball with your eyes closed. (laughs) It's very difficult. I went from having a zero batting average to being one of the highest batting averages in the league. I went from playing on the team that barely won a game to a team that played in the championship that year. Down here on the lower right, that beautiful hunk of... That was me. And this was Trevor in the top. That's a long time ago. If I took that hat off, I'd have hair. Yeah, I would see it. But something happened to me in this moment. This something happened. And later on, me and Trevor played obviously on the same team together, and we won a championship together. This was the championship team, by the way. But what happened? What happened to this devilishly handsome man? <laughs> what took him from bench warmer to champion? Someone took time to show me. Someone took time to show me that could be more than what I was. More than that, it birthed a vision in me. And it birthed a mindset into me. And I had an understanding that I could be more. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we forget who we are until someone comes along and reminds us. So today, if you allow me just a little bit, I want to be your Trevor Green. Can I be your Trevor Green this morning? If you got your Bibles, if you don't, it's right up here. But we're going to go to the book of Psalms, 122 and 1. And we're going to read this. This is a passage. Uh, I'll explain it a little bit here in a minute. It's called The Songs of Ascent. And the way it reads is this way. 
And it's a very familiar scripture. It says this. It says, I was glad. This is David talking. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I mean, he's heard that before. Heard that. Going to the house of the Lord generated a response. This word glad, we don't need to lose it. What's the deep meaning? If you look this word up in Hebrew, it says rejoice. That's what it really means. It's not just glad, I'm glad. I'm glad that we're going to have dinner this afternoon. I'm glad we're having a man's group. No, I'm rejoicing. David said, I'm rejoicing. This word means rejoicing. It's deeper than just glad. It's rejoicing. There was some, what, so what he was saying here is, I rejoiced when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I hope that's where you're at this morning. When you think about coming into this place, when you think about being involved in this, I hope there's a factor of rejoicing that's inside of you when you come into the house of the Lord. When David heard them say, let us go into the house of the Lord, there became an outward manifestation to an inward dedication to God. An outward manifestation to an inward dedication for God and with God. Suddenly, it didn't matter what was going on in life. It didn't matter what trouble was, he was having. It didn't matter what the struggles were. David understood that at the Lord's house, there was a reason to rejoice. What needs to be noticed is that there is an undercurrent of anticipation that David has in these scriptures that I talked about earlier. There's an undercurrent uh, and a demeanor change and an attitude change for David. There was an expectation for something when he went to the house. When, you just don't go rejoicing into the house of the Lord if you're not expecting something to happen when you get to the house of the Lord. There was an expectation in David's life. There was a, 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 a demeanor about him that changed. I want to talk to you about this. This is where the, the crux of the message this morning. It's the process of becoming a player instead of a spectator. And the first thing we have to do is we have to stop worshiping idols. Probably what you're thinking right now is, whew, I've dodged that one because I don't worship idols. Biblical definition of an idol. It's a physical or material image or form representing a reality are being concerning divine and thus an object of worship. I totally messed that up reading it, but you, it's back there. It's the big letters behind me. What it is, it's a physical or material image that represents something that we worship. The number one idol that keeps many people from being a player in, in, instead of turning from a spectator is... themselves the reason why I know this is true is because at times I've been my own idol see we are our own we are the filter we are the gateway you whatever comes into your life you allowed it to come into your life whether that's God a video game oh I felt conviction I need to A sport, a hobby, a relationship, fill in the blank. You allowed that to happen. That was your choice. You are the gatekeeper. You are the filter by which everything flows through. Which makes you, if you're making the wrong decisions, your own idol. Because idol, being an idol is about finding pleasure in, in what you want. It's a choice. It's either to find pleasure or maintain comfort. You're, you become the idol of your own self. In the great words of the great philosopher, the great theologian, Michael Jackson. It starts with the man in the mirror. It starts with the woman in the mirror. You're going to make a choice. You're going to make a decision. What am I going to worship today? What am I going to do today? Bottom line is we are responsible. 
I'm going to take you to a set of scriptures that we read and sometimes we just don't really get it. But I want to take you to these, these scriptures in Matthew 16, verse 13 through 19. You know, the one time I don't put the scriptures in my notes and I have to read it, it's so small. Oh my goodness, there they are. Now, when, this, is a, this is an important scripture. I want to talk to you. I'm going to step out of the way so you can actually see it and I don't block it. But this is what the scripture says. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's a lot of things going on right there. There's four things that's happened here. Christian maturity comes from one thing. You have to, be, have, to have understanding. You have to have spiritual revelation. You have to have a godly calling, an appointment, and a purpose, and then you have to have power. And that's what Peter was talking about, what was happening here in this situation. God pointed out that Peter, he had understanding. He knew, he knew, what Jesus, he knew who Jesus was. That cannot come from logic. That cannot come from your mind. That has to come from the heart. That has to come from the heart this morning. This can't be a textbook answer. This has to be real. It has to be deeply, deeply intellectual. It has to be thought through. It has to be understood from the heart. When I was a, back a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I, was, I went on a journey because I had God ask me this question, who do you say that I am? And he basically said, you know what? You've had a lot of people tell you a lot of things, but who do you say that I am? And I had to go on a journey, and I'm still going on it today, and I had to tear down everything that I thought was important in my life, my pillars that I thought was people had placed in my life, and I had to find it out for myself. And God's going to ask you one of these days who you think that he is or who you know that he is, and you've got to answer that. But that only comes through revelation, personal revelation. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to Peter, but it was the Father. The Father revealed it. And when God reveals things, then he imparts very specific callings on our life, very specific appointments into our life, and he lets us know what we are doing. But after that comes power. Once we understand that, God starts putting power into our lives. This is the point. Peter said, you are the Christ. Jesus said, you are the rock. When you proclaim to the world who Jesus is, Jesus will proclaim to the world who you are. What we need to understand is that if any of these steps are missing that I talked about a minute ago, then it all stops. It all stops. We must have understanding that comes with revelation that brings calling and purpose into our life that is activated and unleashed is the power of God into our life. Peter was on his way from being a spectator to a player. Now, it's very important for me to explain the context of this in light of idolatry. They were standing in Caesarea Philippi, which means something. When Peter was talking to, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you remember that part? This is the gates of hell. 
Welcome, welcome to the gates of hell. This is a place in Sisera I feel, but I took this picture when I was in Israel. This is one of my pictures. This is the gates of hell. Quite literally, Jesus was standing there with Peter and said, the gates of hell, Peter, will not prevail against us. Now, what does this represent? This was a place of idol worship. This was a place of idol worship. This is the, they, they worshiped the god Pan. What Christ is saying here, and what he was saying to, to, to the church is, there's a lot of things that can happen in the church, but idol worship's not going to be one of them. Idol worship is not going to be one of them. The gates of hell cannot prevail, Peter. You're the church. You're the rock. This, we can't have this. We can't have that. Quite literally, Jesus could stand there and point. Your passive, that's a, that's a hard one, right? But your passivity as a Christian is idolatry in the eyes of God. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to search yourself this morning. I'm asking you to try to find yourself this morning. If you can get past the idolatry in your life, guess you can, you can start establishing some spiritual disciplines and I want to plug something. We are coming up in next month. We are going to start a series. It's going to be fantastic. And it's going to help you to develop some spiritual disciplines in your life. Come with a notepad. Come with a, a laptop. I don't care what you come. Come in the front and cross-legged and take notes. I don't care what you do. Get here. Because it's going to help you. And once you get some spiritual disciplines established in your life, what happens next is you have that anticipation that I talked about. Because nothing's holding you back. You're just coming like, okay, God, well, kid in the candy store. Okay, God, what are we going to do? do today? What are you doing today? Expectation. Kill the idols in your life. Develop some spiritual disciplines in your life. And then watch God work in your life, in your expectations. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and give you a hope for your future. For more information about our church, visit us at ourjourney.tv. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week!